we're going to begin with a new topic, which would be the nature of God, kind of looking at what God reveals about himself in scripture so that we actually understand who and what God is. And actually, I kind of do have a little bit of statement on exactly that, which would be the nature of God. So the purpose of this course is to examine what God reveals about himself so that we can only so that we can fully understand who and what he is by analyzing his essence and his attributes, which of course he is going to reveal to us in scripture in a lot of different ways he reveals that to us. So we're going to learn about really who God actually is. And I think that's such an important thing for us to really understand. So starting out, of course, with the concept of a nature, the nature of a being. Uh, that would be where we really want to begin in understanding you know, that this is, when we're talking about the nature of something, we're talking about the combination of the essence and the attributes. So the essence is the underlying substance by which something is made up of. And then the attributes are what that substance has inherently the ability to do. So these are actually, so attributes are very specific. Now, attributes are not something that can be done for a little while in relation to a circumstance or something that are true all the time. An example of this, because a lot of times people will put attributes, one of the attributes is God is omnipresent. The problem with that is what about prior to creation? There was nothing to be present to. So that's actually not an attribute that actually goes back to his essence which is an aspect of his immensity, how large, how big of a being that he actually is. And that's why currently in creation, he is present everywhere. And so it's not really an attribute of it. It's more of a, um, well, like I said, the effect of the essence. So in looking at, of course, essence is the other underlying substance of the being. And this is anything, by the way. It's not just God. This We're using terms that we can understand so that we're understanding ultimately who God is. But this, like I said, it, it impacts everything. Attributes are the natural ability of the essence. Could we uh, describe this, you know, maybe as, you know, like I said, what, what is the nature of a tree? What is its underlying substance? What can that underlying substance naturally do? You know, there's certain things that are related. One of the things that it cannot do is walk. It doesn't have that inherent ability. It can't talk, you know, other stuff like that. Um, so we're going to look at the same, we're going to apply those same principles. So both, of course, when we take both of them and we put them together, then we're talking about the nature of something. So we're going to do the same thing with God. The person uses the essence and the attributes, but the person is not the same thing as the nature. It would be more part of the nature. But person is a use of the essence and attributes. Uh, there's a little bit of a distinction between that, and we'll look at that a little bit more in understanding that also. So I think, by the way, that'll really help us understand the Trinity and how that works. Okay. So in looking at human essence, this is something we are a little bit more familiar with because we actually possess this particular nature. Uh, the human nature and then the essence of the actual human is a body, soul, and spirit. So we are made up of three different parts. Uh, we cannot be divided away from any of these parts. They are, they are what we are to our very core which means when a person passes away, and we have scripture to show that even when people pass away, they have a temporary body. Because without a body, we have no way to in any way express ourselves. We need that physical body in order to do that. Now, this is over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, where we get this. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blamelessly at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of course, this particular passage, when, when you go into the original language, it's a little bit stronger. 
but I think it's pretty solid in the English. You know, that it's not saying that the spirit and the soul are the same. It wouldn't make any sense in, in even in an English word or sentence. You know, you wouldn't normally do that. So, but of course, in the original language, it's the spirit, the soul, and the body. So it's very, very specific in the way that it's describing it. So those are our three parts that we have. Now, of course, we're very familiar with the body part of it, but what about the spirit? Or what about the soul? Well, when we begin to understand what those are, it's actually pretty obvious that we have them. The soul being the emotional center. And of course, for this physical body, the soul directly relates to the physical life that it has. And then the spirit, which would be more of our rational side. And then of course, they use the physical body. Now inherently, our nature has the knowledge of good and evil. It's actually a part of our nature that we act, we possess this, which means that whether you are saved or unsaved, whether you reject God or whatever, you actually inherently as a human being have the ability to discern between what is good and evil. This doesn't mean you're gonna do or choose good or choose evil. It just means you actually, we inherently have this ability. Romans chapter 2 and verse 14 talks about this. Romans chapter 2 and verse 14 it says, For when the Gentiles who do not have law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves. Now, what is he actually talking about there? The Gentiles don't have law. They're, the Gentiles can't claim the Mosaic law. That is for Israel. Is it, but yet, when a Gentile does something related to the law, that is a law within itself. That involves our conscience. So you know that if we didn't have the inherent ability to discern good and evil, we would never do anything that was good, never anything related to the law. And of course, you look at the Mosaic law, is it a rational law? It actually is. Um, it's, it's amazing how many people that really don't understand the Mosaic law, they want to harp on it and they want to talk about, you know, in some cases I've heard them, you know, well, it condones slavery and all this other stuff. No, actually, it does not. If you actually understand what it's saying, you know, it is to treat people fairly. And, and of course, if you do harm, you, it, there's the appropriate payment for that harm. It's not letting anybody get away with things. Well, the Gentiles, of course, they didn't have, they didn't know the Mosaic law. Many of the Gentiles had no clue about the Mosaic law, but yet they were doing things that were very clearly in the Mosaic law because inherently, and we inherited this from Adam, we have the ability to discern good and evil. Now, of course, the good and evil that is talking about here is that which is beneficial and that's which causes calamity. Those are the two. Now, uh, like I said, sadly, we do uh, tend to go the wrong way on that. Uh, we tend to like the bad more than we do the good, which is not, not a good thing at all. Now, um, all unsaved are by, oops, actually I jumped one there. I wanted to jump back there. The knowledge of good and evil. No, actually, maybe I put it out of order in my slide is what I did. Ah, yes. So the next one would be uh, those in the church, that is the body of Christ, share an equality of the divine nature. So now as a ones who inherently have the ability to know good and evil, those who are actually in the church share an equality of the, of a, the divine nature. So we have a slightly different aspect in relation to what our nature can actually now do because we actually fellowship or share in common with a quality of God's nature. So we can express things in a different way or express things that we couldn't do before. Or another way of saying this, because a lot of times, you know, it's, it's so overlooked, you know, prior to being saved, we couldn't do anything that was righteous. Oh, we could do things that looked good to us, but did they look good to God? No. 
There was nothing. But can a Christian now act righteously? And I'm talking about a righteousness that God can look at and he, say, and he says, that's right. A righteousness that Satan can go and accuse you of something and God can look at you and say, no, he's doing it right. We couldn't do that before being Christians because we didn't have that quality. And we see this over in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. It says, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of a, a divine nature. Well, it says of the divine nature, but really it's saying of a quality of the divine nature. Uh, another way of saying that is we don't become God, but we actually have a, we share in common something with his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, of course, he's going on to talk about this is by his divine power. He has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through a full knowledge, full experiential knowledge of the one who called us. And as a result of that and these exceedingly great promises that we have, we actually are partakers. And this word partaker, if I recall, actually is a word that means to um, share in common. So we share as Christians, we have a commonality with God's nature. And what would that commonality be? It would really actually be summed up in the fruit of the spirit, wouldn't it? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, meekness, etc. Those are the things that we can now express where prior to salvation, we could not express those. Now on, on the other side of that, I got to jump back a little bit here. All unsaved are by nature children of wrath. So everybody who is not saved is, as to their nature, they are actually children of wrath, which means they're going to face God's wrath. This is over in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of, the wrath, of wrath, just as the others. And this is children of, if I recall, it's of uh, the wrath. Nope, this is children of a quality of wrath. So a quality of wrath is, when we understand that from Romans chapter 1, is when God permits humans to go their own way and, of course, reap the results thereof. He's not going to stop them from going their own way. He's going to let them fill up to the full their sins, and they're going to pay in full for the works that they actually do. Where for somebody who he loves, what does he do when we refuse to stop sinning? Discipline. He'll discipline. And he'll discipline you to the point to where he will put you to death before he'll allow you to be condemned with the world system. That's an expression of love. That is not something he does to unbelievers. You know, so when an unbeliever actually gets away with a bunch of bad things, that unbeliever might think, oh, I got away with it. But the reality is, no, you did not. And you're going to stand before God and you're going to be judged for your works. We used to be that, but we're no longer. Okay, but by nature, they are. Now, of course, it does make sense when you understand what does what is the end result of an expression of the sin nature? It's always death. Sin brings wrath. So it makes sense that one who is unsaved is by nature a child belonging to or, or a, a child, here it says, of wrath. You could actually see, even say belonging to wrath. Um, then we have, of course, those as human beings that can go against their own nature. And going, doing something that's contrary to your nature. Serving those who are not by nature gods is an example. Now, we are actually going against the nature of something. Uh, Galatians chapter 4 and verse uh, 8 talks about this. In Galatians chapter 4 and verse 8, it says... But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. Now, what is this talking about here? It's talking about a human being that is making up gods. 
Some of them bow down to sticks and stones. Uh, some of them make up, you know, these completely fanciful um, demigods and other things along those lines. I mean, we still have, you know, from centuries, Zeus and all these other ones that they, the Greek gods, these are just made up gods that are not actually gods by nature, which means their inherent ability, their essence and their attributes are not godlike. <laughs> Yet we make them as if they're God. We're serving them as if they're a God, but by nature, they're actually not. Um, they're not gods at all by nature. Uh, we can contradict our own nature. You know, and this is going against what you as a human being are. Romans chapter one and verse 26. Now, in Romans chapter 1, of course, starting in verse 18, is talking about how a quality of God's wrath is being expressed. And in that, he's allowing man to go the way that they want to in rejecting him. And here in verse 26, is for, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even the women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. And of course, it also talks about the men doing the same thing in the, con in the context there. To where now they are doing something that is completely contrary to their nature. And they really want it to be their nature, but the reality is it's not their nature. It's completely contrary to that. Now, going back, by the way, this is a result of exchanging the truth related to God for the lie. And what is the lie? The lie is independence from God. That is what the lie is. That's the one that Satan started this whole thing with. Is he actually decided he was going to do something contrary to what God wanted. And you know, the reality is Satan had it pretty good. He had a nice little rock that he was uh, ruling the universe from. And how do I know it was a nice little rock? Because we're on it and it's a pretty nice place you know it was a whole lot better when it didn't have cor corruption in it but god's going to restore that you know but he decided that wasn't sufficient and he was going to set his throne above the stars of god and put himself up where god is at the lie he was going to do that independently when man begins to reject god god lets humans go in that direction and that, of course, ends it really bad. I mean, it, it's not just, it's not talking about just homosexuality here. It's talking about the very core of a person's ability to properly uh, assess things. It impacts your ability to have a proper opinion when you're looking at facts. And every now and then we'll, we'll get that. We'll get that with somebody who is extremely intelligent and they will say the stupidest thing in relation to the to the facts you know it's like they can lay out the facts nice and clean and then their conclusion you're just like how one of the biggest ones is for somebody anybody as a human being to stand up and say there is no god you know how absurd that is if you really think about it I mean, we know how big our universe is, or do we? We actually don't. And we haven't even been off this rock. And I don't know if you could really count the moon because, you know, it's kind of still within our atmosphere-ish, you know, or slightly, but we haven't gone to Mars. We haven't gone anywhere. We haven't gone and looked under all the rocks in all the universe and said, oh, no, no, there's no God here. You know, it's a really absurd statement when they say stuff like that. It's because they're uh, rejecting God and they don't want there to be a God. But that doesn't change reality. So the human nature, of course, is body, soul, and spirit. We have an inherent ability. This is part of our, um, and what I suppose we could actually call this an attribute. We have the ability to know good and evil because it is part of our essence now. Um, the church actually has a quality of God's nature. 
So there's a little bit uh, in difference in the essence of the human there. And then of course, all unsaved are actually uh, ones who are uh, by nature, children of wrath. Um, and now going on from there, we wanna look at the divine nature and what is involved in the divine nature. Uh, God does actually reveal things about his divine nature. One example of this is his underlying essence is simple. And by simple, it means there is one thing that makes him who he is, and that's spirit. That is his, the substance that makes him exactly who he is. Now, unlike humans, we have three parts. God only has one, and it's only spirit. He is not three separate gods with the same type of essence and attributes. Okay, so we, we're also going to look at that in relation to his, uh, I don't know, I think actually I dropped the verse here. Why didn't I put that verse in there? Oh, I probably come back to it a little bit later. Yeah, okay, I come back to it a little bit in, later in the notes. Because there actually is scripture that specifically states that God is spirit. And that's where we're getting that from. So this is a little bit more of a summary uh, or an introduction, shall we say. So, um, so we do not, God is not three separate gods that, same, that have the same essence and attributes. He's actually only one God. He's one God with three persons who share the same essence and attributes. Now, of course, as I was talking about earlier, uh, persons are actually different from the actual essence. Uh, persons, let's see, where did I actually get to that? Uh, I do get to that a little bit later down. Okay, so I'll just flow with the notes for the moment because I'm going to come back to person so that we can really begin to understand that concept. But God is one, there is one God, there is only one God but there are three persons. You know, so there isn't a division within God at, at, at any aspect. It's not like part of God is the Son and part of God is the Father and part of God is the Holy Spirit. They're all one being and they're all God. That is a little difficult for us to, as humans to understand, but really actually not that out far outside of reality of what we understand things. And what do I mean by that is you start getting into some of the molecular levels of uh, our creation and around us, we begin to understand a whole lot of different things. You know, we have certain things have attributes that we don't think is normal, something that appears to be solid. They've proven it, like the human body is like seventy percent air. Yeah, the human and body. Never saw yeah. It. It's like, huh? Yeah, <laughs> and and that is a good example. You know, our, our physical body actually it, it appears to be solid, but most of it is not solid. <laughs> yeah, not in the same way. Um, and there's you know, and we are talking down to a very molecular level, which is amazing that we can get down to that. And when we get down that, that far, it's a whole nother world there. It's quite amazing, you know. So, there is, and really, of course, that impacts not only our understanding of creation and what's around us, but who actually created it. Uh, going down to the molecular level, and that would be something that would be, I've read a few books on some of this stuff, and it's really interesting because it, show, it so clearly shows there's a creator. There's just no way you, there could not be a creator. You get to the point to where, what do they call it? Uh, it's, you cannot irreducible complexity where you can't go any smaller or it will never work. That's it. You know, and there's a lot of those. So God is one God, but three persons and they share in the same essence and they share in the same attributes, but they are not three gods who have the same essence and attributes. So there's a distinction there. 
Uh, God cannot go against his nature. This is interesting to really understand who God is. He cannot go against his nature. Now, can a human go against a human nature? We've actually already shown they do. But God cannot go against his nature. This is something that within the type, the type of being that he is, he can never go contrary to what he is, ever. Different aspect than a human. God cannot lie. Lies come from Satan. They are not something that God can do. And that, of course, goes right to the fact that God cannot go against his nature. Therefore, he cannot lie because he's going to be one that involves uh, seeing things as they really are in truth. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18 talks about this. It says that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for this refuge to lay hold of the hope uh, set before us. And your word impossible here is actually saying it is something that he does not inherently possess. So as a being, God does not inherently possess the ability to lie. It's pretty incredible when you think about it. That also means when God says something, it's actually true. He's not going to say something that is not true. That does not mean that what he says you're going to fully understand. A good example of this is even though he revealed in the Old Testament that Christ would die and he would be raised from the dead, they didn't understand it. The, the spirit beings didn't understand it. And they're far more intelligent than we are. Now, of course, when Christ was raised from the dead, then they understood what he was talking about. After the fact, he doesn't have that inherent ability. And we also have this over in Titus, <clears throat> Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, where it talks about this. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Same concept. He doesn't have the inherent ability to actually lie. It's not something that is part of his nature at all. So... Because God reveals the fact that he cannot go against his nature. He cannot lie. He cannot deny himself. Okay. Now, this, of course, goes along with the fact that he cannot lie, but he's also not going to deny himself. Second Thessalonians, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithless. Why? Because I did not say that right. Let's try that again. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Why is he faithful to his word? Even if we don't. If we don't, you know, if we're ones who are not faith, we're faithless. Um, he cannot deny himself. He can't go against who he is. When God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He's going to be faithful. And, you know, remember, faithful goes back to the ability to trust someone at their word. It would. Kind of yep. And that actually is a very good point when you understand that if you are saying that the church took, takes the place of Israel, then God denied himself. And that is not what scripture reveals. As a matter of fact, scripture very clearly says he cannot deny himself. Now, he gave Israel a promise. That promise was not, and you go back and you look at those covenants, they were not conditional covenants. Not the actual core covenants. There is a conditional covenant on the circumcision, but the core covenants, the land promises that he gave to uh, Abraham, those have no conditions on them. The only condition God put on those was himself. And again, this is your word, um, dunamai which means he doesn't have the inherent ability to deny himself. He will be who he is. And then, of course, the fact that God is not a man. And this is over in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and I will, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? You know, God is not going to change his mind. Okay. 
God is going to, he just, he's, like I said, the, the main focus on this particular passage is we cannot impose upon God what we think of as humans. This was one of the major problems that happened right after the Tower of Babel. And we see that in Romans chapter one, where we have people who took God and they exchanged him for the image of what? Corrupt man. Man is where they started out with. They began to, con to take a proper opinion of who God is and pervert it to that of a human being. So now they start making God vulnerable where God is not vulnerable. They start giving him attributes that he doesn't have as a being. He doesn't exist in that way. God is not a man. And of course, you know, therein also the fact that he doesn't lie and he's not one who should repent. It's interesting here in this word repent. This does not mean that God will not change his mind in some cases. This is, by the way, the same word repent used over in Genesis chapter 6, where God is looking at what man has done. And he's saying that it, uh, it repented God. God was like, I'm going to just well, I'm going to wipe you out now because of what you've done. Now, we were in a period of time where you think things are bad today. No, so this every day, it was nothing but wickedness. That's what people thought about every day, all day long how they could get one up on everybody else. It was very bad. Thankfully, we have the restrainer now, which would be the Holy Spirit, who prevents a lot of this stuff from manifesting. So he doesn't repent. If God tells us, and of course, this again would go back to not only Israel, but also our salvation. God is not, we're not going to get up to heaven and God's going to be like, eh, change my mind. You know, I'm not sure if I really want you. That's not the way Christianity works. That's not who God is, actually. That's contrary to who God is. He's not one who actually repents. So um, 